Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 81, Revelation, Idols and Demons. And in this episode, we're going to look at Revelation 9, 13 through 21, which is a continuation of the, the, the locusts from the abyss that we looked at in episode 78. We're going to continue to see Satan's work and the darkness and the smoke and the deceit and the deception and the demonic that inflict our world. And what I want to do in this episode in particular is point out a few of the things that surface in this particular trumpet. But what I really want to do is highlight for you things that we tend not to even look for in the book of Revelation because they sound familiar and instead tend to focus all of our attention on the parts that sound unfamiliar and really scrapping and grasping for just what those things mean and how we can understand those crazy images. And I want to discourage us, at least for this episode, from doing that precisely because something that shows up at the end of chapter 9, most readers of Revelation tend to gloss right over. And yet the way John has structured this book, and particularly the way he has structured the sixth trumpet, what we find in the final several verses of Revelation 9 is really the heart of what's going on in the sixth trumpet. And so I want to take some time to look at that as well as look at how idols and demons tend to prevent people from being able to repent. And we'll just walk through several passages. And again, I want this to be pastoral. That is my goal as we try to unpack what John has for us here. So let's just jump right in. As we begin this week's episode, allow me just to read Revelation 9, 13 through 21. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Now, in the the verse actually that immediately precedes the passage that I just read is Revelation 9:12, and what it says is the first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. And this short little verse um, actually gives us a bit of a clue regarding what we are to make of this sixth trumpet. Because the next time the woe is referenced is all the way in chapter 11, verse 15, identifying for us that the second woe has now passed, and behold, a third woe is soon to come. And what that indicates for us, which is why it's always a good idea to read forwards and backwards in Revelation wherever you happen to be in the book, because there are clues sprinkled out throughout that help you make sense of it. But that is that that what we read from Revelation 9, 13, all the way to Revelation eleven fourteen, is all part of the sixth trumpet. It's not just what we read in the passage that I read for you. And what we're going to talk about today is very applicable, but I want you to remember that what we're going to see in chapter 10 and halfway through chapter 11 is also related to this sixth trumpet. And the way it's related is significant, and so that will help us as we try to interpret what's happening in this scene. Now again, this uh, we've spoken about this um, a few times already, recognizing that 
the seals affected a quarter of the earth and that the trumpet judgments affect a third of the earth. We are dealing with and describing the same series of events only in increasing intensity. And so some of the same wars and bloodshed and famine and death that we saw recounted in the seals, that same type of thing is happening again, only it's being described in a little bit more intensity. Now, instead of a quarter of the earth being affected, an entire third of the earth is affected. But as we looked at with the locusts, we're dealing with the presence of the enemy and the way that he goes about killing people in this world, tormenting people in this world, causing agony in this world. And while it was locusts in the first half of chapter 9, here in the second half of chapter 9, we see horses. And it's interesting that the focus primarily um, isn't really on the riders of these horses, as you might imagine if this was a vicious army being described. Instead, it's on the horses themselves. And it says that they wore breastplates the color of fire, sapphire, and sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues... A third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses, not the riders, but the horses, is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. Now this is the heart of the confusion right here in verses you know, 16 through 19, which I just read for you. But a couple things I want to point out. The first is that you have this, this three, three time repeated phrase, fire and smoke and sulfur, fire and smoke and sulfur, fire and smoke and sulfur. And each time it is coming out of the mouth of these horses, these horses again, that have something resembling lion's heads and serpents for tails. Now those two images right there, every time in revelation, the word serpent is referenced. It's always a reference to Satan. One of the clearest is in Revelation chapter 12, which we will have quite a bit of fun with in explaining the way that that Revelation as a whole works. But in verse 9 of Revelation 12, it says, The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And so we have this idea that what is left in the wake of these horses, what is trailing behind them, what is driving them is in fact satanic power. And it says by means of them, by means of this power, this fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths, by this means they wound people. And again, if we're following the symbolism as it is used in the book of Revelation, if we go all the way back to chapter 1, I reminded you and showed you the way in which the sword protruding out of the mouth of Jesus was in fact Jesus' spoken words. The words that Jesus says will actually judge people on the final day from John chapter 12. So the words that Jesus speaks is in fact this sharp sword. It is the way Jesus does battle. He speaks the truth. Those who do not want to listen to the truth remain in the dark. They do not come into the light and allow Jesus to deal with the deception and the darkness and the blindness that has so much taken a part of their lives. Well, here, if we keep in mind that something coming out of the mouth of someone isn't actually what is being described there, but it is rather a symbol for something else, if we apply that same mentality to this passage, what we have repeated three, maybe four times is the mouth of these horses. The mouth, something is coming out of their mouth, and what is it? It's fire, smoke, and sulfur. This is billowing... Um, smoke maybe it's billowing some presence is coming out of their mouth that is straight from hell itself these words that are coming out if you might think of them that way if a sword coming out of jesus's mouth can be words of truth then fire smoke and sulfur coming out of horses mouths horses with lion's heads could very easily be deception and again i'm not making this stuff up let me reread for you Revelation 12, 9. Listen to the way John describes it. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, 
the deceiver of the whole world. And so Satan himself is referred to as a deceiver, and it is by means of them, by means of the fire, smoke, and sulfur, i.e. by means of their deceptions, that these powerful horses with lion's heads actually wound people. This is precisely the way Revelation is intended to work. And so what happens when this sixth angel announces who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, this takes us all the way back to chapter 7, where before these angels were allowed to be released, God came in and sealed his servants who weren't going to be harmed by this same events. This is what is now being spoken about. We've gone over chapter 7. We've looked into chapter 8. We've recognized what the Lord God did to protect and to seal his 144,000. You can go back and listen to that episode again to remember what we said there. But now these angels are being freed who he, who were told in, in verse 14 are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, in, in Jewish time, in ancient Israel's time, beyond the Euphrates was to the north and the northeast of Israel. All of their fears resided there. Um, Assyria as a kingdom was in that direction. Eventually Babylon was in that particular direction. And so the Lord multiple times in the Old Testament uses this Kingdom from the north is the way it's described, but it is this north-northeast direction, which is the direction of the Euphrates River um, in relationship to the nation of Israel. But it is a fear that some unknown place is coming from there who is going to bring great harm on the people. And in Isaiah 5, uh, the Lord says this to his own people through Isaiah, he will raise a signal for nations far away, right? So think maybe Assyria or Babylon and whistle for them from the ends of the earth. N now you're, we're, we're talking about these four angels who are positioned at the four corners of the earth and are now being beckoned um, and you know, drawn in in order to bring these, these horses breathing fire, smoke, and sulfur. And behold, quickly, speedily they come. None is weary, None stumbles, none slumbers or sleeps. Not a waistband is loose, not a sandal strap broken. Their arrows are sharp, all their bows are bent. Their horses' hooves seem like flint, and their wheels like the whirlwind. Their roaring is like a lion. Like young lions they roar, they growl and seize their prey. They carry it off and none can rescue. I think John has... A little bit of this image in mind when he's writing his sixth trumpet here in Revelation 9. We've got references to their roaring is like a lion. They growl. They seize their prey. Their horse's hooves seem like flint. And we are whistling for them from the ends of the earth um, from the north. And that, that's actually a passage that Jeremiah references when he's speaking about the judgment that is not only going to come on God's unfaithful people, but will also come on the nations themselves. Here's what Jeremiah 46, 4 and 23 through 24 say. Harness the horses. Mount, O horsemen. Take your stations with your helmets. Polish your spears. Put on your armor. She makes a sound like a serpent gliding away. For her enemies march in force and come against her with axes like those who fell trees. They shall cut down her forest, declares the Lord, though it is impenetrable, because they are more numerous than locusts. They are without number. The daughter of Egypt shall be put to shame. She shall be delivered into the hand of a people from the north. And so what is happening as we continue to walk through this is recognizing that there is some enemy coming from a great distance who the Lord is going to use to seek to bring um, repentance and judgment, of course, on those who stand opposed to him. But what I really want to focus in on in this particular episode is what takes place in the last two verses of the chapter. It simply says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor, giving, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And it is verses 
20 and 21 that, that I just read that I think is one of those things that, that people sort of just blow right past. They're like, okay, man, God's going to bring all this judgment. Nobody's going to repent. Look at these hard-hearted people in this world. I mean, I just can't believe it. Well, let's just you know move on. We know what that means, right? We're familiar with talks of repentance or we're familiar with lists of you know sins that people commit. And I don't feel like these verses get that much attention. But the question I want to pose for us in this episode is why? Why don't people repent when this type of judgment comes? And you might have never asked that question, or, or maybe you have and you, you just automatically know the answer, and, that, and that's great. But I've wrestled with this for a while, and I've wrestled with why is it that people don't repent when life begins to unravel? And I think idolatry and demonic issues or you know, idols and demons, I think help us get a little bit under the surface. Um, We've looked at, in the last several episodes, recognizing that idolaters are oftentimes punished by their own sins. And so part of the harm that is mentioned in verse 19 anyways, talking about by means of their mouths and the sulfur and fire and, and smoke coming out of their mouths, part of the harm that's referred to there, this this wounding, includes deceiving people to participate in idolatry. And then to actually continue to be complicit in the idolatry once they're involved in it. Now, we've looked at this from the beginning, um, all the way back to episode five um, in this podcast, Made in the Image of God. We talked about what it means to be made in His image and how we are supposed to reflect Him in the way that we live. We looked at in the fall of man in, in verse in, in episode 16 or in episode 17, what went wrong. We looked at the fact that when mankind chose to take of the fruit that the Lord forbid him to take from, or as I explained in that episode, what that means is that we've decided for ourselves the best way to rule and therefore began to image something that more resembled the serpent who once deceived Eve to do that in the first place, then we are actually imaging God. And in episode 46, Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega, I took an entire episode to explain how idolatry could actually be at work in the Old Testament. And it is not something as simple as, oh, today we are worshiping Baal. Oh, today we are worshiping the Lord. No, rather, the ways that you believe the Lord rules the world will be in direct proportion to the way you think you are called to rule the world. And believe it or not, It is possible to think you are worshiping the Lord when your actions, lifestyle, and belief systems are in reality more um, similarly aligned with Baal than they are with the Lord. And it's a disturbing reality. Or as we looked at in episode 53, Revelation, he who has an ear, we are getting into this idea that Revelation 9 references once again when it says um, you worshiping idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk. Idols and demons and the encouragement that demons give for you to actually worship idols is not something merely physical. It is the deepest held beliefs that people have about who God is and therefore who they are called to be and to recognize the way belief systems in this world actually work and whether or not you are deceived in your thinking or whether you are really listening to the truth and being set free by it. Now in episode 78, I just want to pull in a a statement I made in that episode because I think it fits here. But in that episode, I said that without God's seal of protection, without his name written on their foreheads, without his thoughts governing their minds and souls, people are at the mercy of whatever the evil one the destroyer, wishes to do to them. And he torments the minds and souls of those who dwell on the earth, who lack the seal of God's name on their thoughts and lives. 
And this is really the key that is at work when it comes time to discuss the work of the evil one, the destroyer, the deceiver, and all of his demons, and the work of idolatry, getting us to think that certain things are true in the world when in fact they're not. And things that aren't true lead you into bondage and into slavery in the ramifications of how those things work themselves out in the end. And that is a very realistic way and a very biblical way to understand the wrath of God. Because God has set the world up to work in such a way That if you follow him and are open to him, it is absolutely true freedom, true hope, true joy, true love. If you follow anyone other than him or believe you are following him, but have bought into a mixture of deception and truth along the way, you find yourself imprisoned. And, and I love the way that N.T. Wright <clears throat> discusses these last several verses about why it is that people don't repent, recognizing that something more needs to happen than just letting people swirl around in their own misery. The Lord absolutely wants people to repent when difficulty comes into their lives. You could either see it as a gift from God that these things are unraveling in a bad sense because he wants to set you free from the deceptions you've bought into, or you can think that God is out to get you and grow stronger and more resistant to him in your hatred. But N.T. Wright, I think, captures it well, and I'd like to use a quote from him to springboard us into several other passages through the Bible to help us make sense of this. Here's what he says. The final verses of chapter 9, which is our section on the people didn't repent, indicate well enough the shape of John's understanding of the basic human plight. Like all mainline Jews of his day, he believed that human evil emerged from idolatry. You become like what you worship. So if you worship that which is not God, you become something other than the image-bearing human being you were meant and made to be. Thus verses 20 to 21 stand in parallel. Worship idols, blind, deaf, lifeless things, and you become blind, death, deaf, and lifeless yourself. Murder, magic, fornication, and theft are all forms of blindness, deafness, and deadliness. Snatching at the quick fix for gain, power, or pleasure while forfeiting another bit of genuine humanness. Repentance, then, is more than just expressing regret for a few peccadilloes, which just means failings or offenses. It is a radical, heartfelt, gut-wrenching turning away from the idols which promise delight but provide death. God longs for that kind of repentance. He will do anything, it seems, to coax it out of his rebellious but still image-bearing creatures. Now, in, in Revelation 9, and, and, I, and I think, I think, um, think N.T. Wright nailed it, honestly, and I'd like to tie in a couple thoughts he said to, to a few passages Um, But in Revelation 9, we're we're talking about idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. We've referenced this already in in Revelation, or I'm sorry, in episode 53, he who has an ear. And and it's, it's actually coming from Psalm 115, and I just read this briefly for you. But it says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. And this is at the heart of what N.T. Wright says, you become like what you worship. So if you worship the Lord, really, you become like him. Again, this is the episode 46, Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega, trying to make sense of how the people could be caught between whether Baal is God or whether the Lord is God. And I would definitely encourage you to go back and re-listen to that episode if you can't remember what it was that I was speaking about. But we have images of God in our minds 
In fact, this is a very, very needed discussion today when it comes to using the three-letter word God to describe this being that we all say we either believe in or we don't. And that is that because God is spirit and because you and I cannot see him, we have to be able to look at some type of manifestation of who God claims to be in order to understand him. Otherwise, in daily communication one with another, you might have a vastly different idea of who and what this invisible God is like than I do. And we are completely at an impasse to know how then we are to live in relation not only to this God, but how we are to treat one another in his name. Well, Jesus, of course, answers all of the dilemma for us. Jesus embodies the very form of God so that you and I know what this God is like. Demons, idols try to blend that. They try to mix that. They try to add a little bit of deception to make things not quite right. And again, I want to remind you, and I know I'm getting kind of worked up here, but I want to remind you, Revelation as a book was not written to Rome. It was not written to Babylon. It was not written to... It was written to the church. And in the churches, we have actual churches in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation who are genuinely wrestling through who Jesus actually is for them and in their own church community. And some of their failure to believe the right things about him are leading them into idolatry themselves. So John is not just given us this explanation of what's going to happen in the end so that you and I know it's all going to be fine. He's calling the church to faithful witness. And what the church does and doesn't believe about Jesus or rightly understand about him will affect the way we witness to the world. And so in 1 John 4, John will say, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. John knows that if your life does not mirror the life of Jesus, there is in fact something about God that you're believing wrongly. And then at the end of 1 John, he says something that you might think is really strange unless you think about it in terms of this idolatry discussion. He says in 1 John 5, 20 to 21, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, I've read a number of commentaries on 1 John, and in verse 21, that just says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Some people think, well, John had more to say, but he got tired and he didn't know what else to write. We don't know how that fits with the rest of the book, but it is one, one final good thought to remember not to buy into idolatry. Oh no, John knows exactly what he's writing here. John said three times in the preceding verse, we know him who is true. We are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourself from any belief that God is in any way, shape, or form anything other than he is revealed in Jesus Christ. If you do not mark that, and watch for that and recognize that Jesus came in the flesh and loved people in the flesh and you don't love your brother in the flesh, but you say you love God, you're a liar, says John. Now, those are incredibly harsh words, but I think our culture needs to hear those just as much as John's did. And that is that we can't relegate our relationship with God, quote unquote, to some immaterial, invisible, hidden, private, personal thing, it must manifest itself in the way that we treat other people. And I would say that one of the primary reasons we don't see it that way is because we've relegated him to just the immaterial or the invisible. And I think Paul was up against this when he wrote to the Corinthians, the Corinthian believers who did not understand that certain practices in the world um, were participating in actual um, religious things, whether or not they thought so. And in chapter 10 of, of 1 Corinthians, I wish I had more time to go into this, but I don't. 
That is in chapter 10, verses 14 to 22. Let me just read for you what what Paul says because he ties together idols and demons in a very, very significant way. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to a sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? This is a passage that I'm afraid gets far too little attention today. But Paul is explicitly saying that what people who do not really know God, what they sacrifice and offer to when they claim to be offering something to God is actually an offering to demons. And Paul cautions the Christians themselves from not wanting them to be participants with demons. What he is saying and has gotten just gotten done saying to them in the first half of 1 Corinthians 10 is that notice the people of Israel who were wayward, who grumbled, who complained, and the Lord allowed some of them to be destroyed by serpents or to be destroyed by the destroyer. It, when we participate in the way we choose to live, it is a participation either in the broken body and blood of Christ or a participation in demons. Why? Because idolatry is always at work front and center. And so one of the big things that is important for us to understand as we're going through Revelation, when we come to the end of chapter 9 and we see that people do not cease, they do not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murderer, murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. It begs the question, does watching people's lives spiral out of control, does allowing the idolatries that they are a part of manifesting in themselves, punishing those who worship those idols by, by trapping them in their own sin. Does that, does judgment alone have the power to change the human heart? This is a question that I strongly encourage every Christian on the planet to ask himself or herself. Does judgment alone have the power to change the human heart. And you remember I said at the very beginning of this episode that the sixth trumpet is the information or rather the, the passage that takes place between chapter 9 verse 13 and chapter 11 verse 14. And it is actually broken up into three sections in the same way that the sixth seal was broken up into three sections. And if you remember the sixth seal, it happened at the end of chapter six, and it concluded with the question, you know, the great day of the wrath of God and of the lamb have come and who can stand, right? And then we watched two more sections unfold in chapter seven that gave us the answer to that question. The first half of chapter 7 was the second part of the sixth seal, and it was showing us the Lord sealing the 144,000. Well, in the second half of chapter 7 in Revelation, or the third part of the sixth seal, we watched the Lord show us a group of people who were standing in his presence, which was the precise answer to the question posed at the end of chapter 6, who can stand? So the sixth seal had three parts. The sixth trumpet also has three parts. And funny enough, 
posed at the end of this first part is this relationship between people not repenting. They didn't repent of the works of their hands. They didn't stop worshiping demons and idols. They didn't repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Chapter 10 is going to be the second section to the sixth trumpet. And the first half of Revelation 11 will be the third section of the sixth trumpet. And it too will address this issue of repentance. And so the reason I'm drawing your attention to it is, first of all, because I want to help you understand the book. I want to help you understand what John is doing. And I want to raise questions for you that you might not be thinking about as you are reading. It is absolutely vital to recognize that despite all of the chaos and the anarchy of these symbols and the destruction that is taking place here, John wants to draw our attention to something. Judgments alone do not seem to have an effect in bringing about repentance in the hearts of those who suffer under the consequences of their own choices. The church needs to recognize this because what Revelation 10 and 11 are going to do is they are going to show us what will produce repentance. And without getting too far ahead of myself, I want to remind you the scroll that the Lamb has received from the one seated on the throne in chapter 5 hasn't been opened yet. As you're following along in Revelation, you do realize, right, that the seven seals were simply the seals put down the signet ring from the king on top of the scroll preventing it from being opened. The seven trumpets are the announcement that this is about to happen. We haven't yet gotten to the actual contents of the scroll itself. That will come in these next sections of the sixth seal, the second and the third sections, Revelation 10, 1 through Revelation 11, 14. So we've, we've got to go back. We've got to go back. We've got to go forward. I'm doing my best, and I hope it's helpful for you. I'm sure you have new questions. I'm sure you have new thoughts. I am doing my best to try to bring you along with John as he's trying to explain these things to us so that you and I don't fall victim to what Paul cautions the Corinthians to. I don't want you to be participants with demons. Can we drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons? Can we partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons? Do you know what John is, or do you know what Paul is saying? Can we participate in a self sacrificial, loving offering of Jesus, which we participate in when we partake of his body and his blood, and at the exact same time be greedy and power hungry? and seeking for control, and jostling for position, and elevating ourselves one over another? Can people do that? Paul is saying, yes, people can. But when they do, it is because they are both trying to participate in the cup and of the table and participating in the demonic. They are crafting an idol of who they think their God really is. And when they act out in those ways of power grabbing and control and greed and jostling for position, they think they are embodying the God that they are worshiping. Paul says, you are embodying the God you are worshiping. It's just that the God you are worshiping is not the Lord. It's Baal. It's Beelzebub. It's Satan. And as a result, when you think you are worshiping the Lord and you act in those ways, you are truthfully worshiping and participating with demons, idols and demons. This is a real thing. It's real in our world just as it was real in John's. And John is about to explain to us how it is then that people can be set free from that. 
how it is then that people are not going to be caught up in being participants with demons and trying to partake of the Lord's table, but most importantly, how it is that the destruction that is going on all around us can in fact be used not to further harden the hearts of those caught in those deceptions, but rather to see those caught in such deceptions repent and be set free from them. And so that's all the time that we're going to take for this week's episode. I, I know this one was a little bit longer. I, I do try to keep these short, but I'm, I'm so glad you're tracking with me. I've had a lot of fun this week interacting with several of you on Facebook who've said you've used the podcast to help you teach your Sunday school classes and to answer questions in some of your Bible studies. A few of you have reached out and said that just certain episodes have, have meant something particularly powerful to you. Thank you. Just thank you for letting me know. Thank you for posting things online to share with other people. Hey, here was an episode that helped. And of course, while I would love for every person to listen to all these episodes from the beginning going forward, I know that that's impractical now as we are in the 80s in terms of episodes. But please share one or two episodes that have meant something to you. Um, just share with a friend or, or post online and, and make a link to Apple Podcasts where others can can jump on and listen to these or, or whatever platform you listen to them on. So thank you for giving me a rating or a review. I know some of you are faithful listeners and have never just taken five minutes to give me a rating. I would ask you to do that, to write a short review, tell me what you think, tell others what, what they might gain from listening in. I would really appreciate that. And thank you again to those who support this podcast on a monthly basis. Um, your, your support and encouragement is just, it's tremendous. And I, I really thank you for it. So that's all the time we have for this week. Talk to you next time.